Social media these days has become a nightmare for many people. It's all about arguing about whose theory is right, arguing about all sorts of ideas that might never have seen the light of day, and many people getting really upset about ideas that differ from their own and about the people that have those differing ideas. The question is, where did tolerance go? South Africa is a society famous for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was all about being willing to hear the stories of others and hear the truths of others and find a place where we can understand and accept those within our own um, life and within our own reality. So tonight what I want to do is have a look at the subject of tolerance See what does it really mean and what does it really entail and how do we understand cultivating tolerance in our own lives. The United Nations Human Rights Commission says that tolerance and reconciliation are key to a just and equitable society. And that is really the essence of what tolerance is about and the necessity of tolerance. If we are to live together in a complex, multicultural society with many cultures and beliefs and ways of doing something, then tolerance is what we need to cultivate. Tolerance is generally defined as a fair, objective and even permissive attitude towards others whose opinions might differ, their practices, their race, their religion, their nationality, their culture, all of those things might differ from their own. You can tolerate something without accepting it, although of course you can't accept something without tolerating it. Accepting is assenting to the reality of the situation or of the other. So acceptance is closer to agreement. It's not quite the same, but it's closer to that agreement. It recognizes a process or a condition or an uncomfortable situation without attempting to change it, to protest it, to exit away from it or anything like that. So similar, but as I said, you can tolerate something without having to accept it. But if you've accepted something, to some extent, you've taken it on board. We're concentrating on tolerance. Um, you know, a good example of what I just said is you can tolerate someone's beliefs without accepting someone's beliefs. You don't have to take them on board, you don't have to agree with them in any way, but you can tolerate them. And yet, from what it sounds like, it's like, well, tolerance should just be about accepting everything then, and clearly that's not going to work. If we are to tolerate um, without having to accept, if we are to tolerate other people's thoughts and ideas, should we tolerate when people stand up and advocate things like uh, the, the sexual abuse of children, or the oppression of other races, or things which are not acceptable in our personal universe. So tolerance is not an unlimited thing, and we have to find what is the limit? What defines the barriers of what is tolerance and what is tolerable? Essentially, tolerance is a virtue. It's, it's kind of an understanding that I expect people to treat me the way that I would treat them. That if I want people to treat me decently and accept the human being I am, then I have to do the same for them. And it's a basically practical way that ensures that society will succeed. Tolerance is also related to a certain amount of open-mindedness because closed-mindedness leads to intolerance. Closed-mindedness is really rooted in uncertainty, fear of the unknown, um, fear of consequences, and the consequence of Closed-mindedness itself is intolerance. It's easy to assume from that that an absence of prejudice 
means that a person is automatically tolerant. But prejudice and tolerance are not actually the same thing. We can hold certain prejudices and be tolerant of certain things at the same time. I mean, I can be prejudiced against people who oppress another person based on their lifestyle, but at the same time, I can be tolerant of that lifestyle. So prejudice and tolerance are not actually opposite sides of the same coin. But tolerance isn't so easy to define. Unlike prejudice, it, it is really grounded in a moral domain, and that is a moral domain that offers a positive approach to understanding other people, to understanding the relationships of people, and mostly, most importantly, to understand people who are different from each other. So, tolerance can be defined really as a fair and objective attitude towards people whose lifestyles or behaviors of some kind differ from your own. And the level of tolerance can be attributed to the level of happiness and contentment in your own life. That is a very powerful thought. The more you experience discontent in your own life and discontent with what's happening to you, the less likely you are to tolerate someone else's life and what's happening to them. So tolerance might not be related to prejudice, but it is related to happiness. The psychologist Ruth Wittenberg says, we often think of tolerance as putting up with something that we dislike or, we, or that we even hate. And, you know, if, if someone is prepared to put up with something, like, I, you know, I don't like the color of your skin or I don't like your lifestyle, but I will serve you in my shop <laughs> and I don't want to lose your custom, that person isn't someone who discriminates, but they are someone who is intolerant. And that lack of discrimination is based on a financial outcome. I'll, you know, I'll accept anyone's money, but that's not the same as tolerating what they, who they are and what they do and what their lifestyle is all about. And at any rate, as Wittenberg says, who wants to be just tolerated or put up with in that sense? At the same time, tolerance itself cannot be indiscriminate. As I was saying early on, indiscriminate tolerance in the most extreme form means do we have to accept people who uh, practice questionable forms of behavior such as um, racism or prejudice or child abuse or whatever the case may be. Should we be tolerating neo-Nazis and people who advocate extreme forms of um, prejudice in a way like that? And that is a good example to think about in the context of what I started off talking about, this diversity of ideas and thoughts and opinions all over social media. Should we just automatically tolerate that everyone has an equally valid opinion. Wittenberg, like many um, philosophers, suggests that then the way, therefore, to think of tolerance is to put it in a moral domain, not, say, a psychological behavior, but that it, in fact, is a moral virtue of some kind. It's a moral obligation, she says, or a duty which involves respect for the individual as well as mutual respect and consideration between people. Moral is these days a little bit of a loaded word, it tends to be strongly connected to religion. Um, these days people associate it with various forms of conservatism. Maybe we can like, mix in the word ethical a little bit to understand our understanding of the word moral, but in terms of what is the right thing to do is our own moral framework. So that kind of tolerance between people uh, um, that is morally based allows for people to 
tolerate conflicting ideas and conflicting beliefs and um, see them as acceptable without having to accept and agree with them. So, for example, you could tolerate a different religion, but you don't have to agree with what they say. In fact, you might even think that they're wrong. But moral tolerance means you are able to understand that for them, they are right. And their right is equal to your right. Their sense of what is right is equal to your sense of what is right. You might think they're misguided, but you would be able to think, but for them that's 100% the truth, and that truth is equal to my truth to them. It's a moral acceptance. It's like different marital practices, marriage practices, might fit within an acceptable moral value. So, I might not um, like the fact that you can get married. I might not agree with that. But I do accept that your right to get married is, as, is equal to my right to get married, even if I don't agree with why. So, it might be that different cultural practices uh, still fit within the same set of acceptable moral values. I don't practice those things, but I accept your right to practice that. And I accept that for you, that is the same as what this is for me. Wittenberg says that while different marriage practices, for example, might fit within acceptable moral values, sexual abuse of children is immoral and therefore can't be tolerated. So that's where morality can draw the boundaries and say there are certain practices that are inherently wrong, whoever does them. And there are certainly there are certain practices that are okay, whoever does them. And that's that difference of the whoever does them. I'm not saying mine is better than yours. That is intolerant. Where I'm saying they're all equal, and as long as no one is harmed, that fits within an acceptable moral framework. Even if I disagree with it, no one is being harmed, that is my moral. My moral isn't about what you believe. My moral is, don't harm another human being. I might not agree with what you believe, but if you're not harming another human being with it, it fits within my moral values, and therefore, I tolerate it. It's when you locate tolerance in the domain of fairness and justice and respect for others, avoiding harming others, then you can understand that tolerance can be viewed as a moral virtue. And it's there that we see that in order to really experience that moral virtue, we need empathy, because empathy is the strongest driver of moral behavior. Empathy is my ability to understand and relate to your feelings and your experiences even though they aren't mine, they, I get them. So, empathy is really the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and appreciate how they must feel, even though you're not in that situation. If you put yourself in someone else's shoes and can feel what it must be like to get discriminated against because of those shoes, then you will understand they might not be my shoes, I might never wear shoes that look like that. I might think they're ridiculous. But I understand that if someone is going to harm me because of that shoes, those shoes, that is wrong. So tolerance arises out of that. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes is really the essence of what tolerance is. You know, on this show, I often like to talk about or think about what the Stoics would have said. And the Stoics themselves don't directly address the issue of tolerance. It would have been probably a little bit unusual 2,000 years ago. Although the Roman Republic, which is in the BC years, was famously tolerant of other people's religions and um, politics for a specific reason. That was what allowed them to conquer much of the rest of the world. 
They took the attitude of don't mess with what people think and believe and you can get them into the palm of your hand and conquer them. And that's what they did. So they had a kind of a tolerant um, Republican society you know, over 2,000 years ago. It would be later in the imperial years, which mostly coincide with the AD years, that uh, intolerance would grow. And so we don't really see it spoken about in Marcus Aurelius' time, the emperor of Rome, who was the great Stoic. But nevertheless, the Stoics do somewhat address the issue of tolerance because it does overlap with some core Stoic ideas. If we have a look, for example, at Epictetus, um, what we call tolerance would be a personal uh, virtue. Tolerating others who disagree with us reflects the recognition that the beliefs of others are not up to us. And that is the key Stoic point. Stoicism is largely predicated on the idea of only worry about what you are in control of. What the only thing that's really relevant to you is what you are in control of. So Epictetus would say, well, you're not in control of another person's beliefs. What another person thinks is not up to you. So you've got to just allow them that. You mustn't get yourself caught up in disagreeing with that because that isn't up to you, so you can't change it. Why disagree with something that you can't change? You're just going to get yourself stressed out. Rather disagree with something you can change. For the rest, maybe you just need to tolerate it. More importantly, he says, other people's beliefs are not necessary for our own happiness. That is such a powerful point. Other people's beliefs are not relevant to our own happiness. Obviously, only our own beliefs are. And that can be very liberating when we try and tolerate people who have different thoughts or ideas of us than us. And we can see it when we allow ourselves to get so upset about people who think differently or who have different theories and ideas about the virus or anything else. We make ourselves unhappy. We make ourselves unhappy over something we have no control over, over someone whose ideas we're not going to change as much as they're not going to change ours. And so all that extreme emotion and anger and hate and the breaking of friendships that seems to arise out of this kind of disagreement becomes extremely irrational. More to the point, perhaps, Marcus Aurelius um, conceives tolerance as a social virtue. Tolerating others who, disagrees with us, who disagree with us is an obligation that we have towards other human beings. It's that basic obligation that says your rational conclusion uh, has um, as much value as mine. It boils down to the ability to see the other person as a human equal to yourself. Remembering the moral guidelines that says it doesn't mean your opinion allows you to harm someone. Then I'm entitled to disagree because it breaks a moral. And further than that, thinking about what are all these disagreements really about, the Stoics point out that tolerance is not just about dealing with people, it's about dealing with situations that you have no control over. And tolerating situations that you have no control over. Use the lockdown as an example. The lockdown is the lockdown. You have no power to actually change that yourself. You do have the power to try and be calm and focus on what you are in control of, or rally and scream against it where you're not in control, and make yourself very angry and very upset and still have absolutely no power to change it. So it's that kind of tolerance that the Stoics draw our attention to. The ability to endure that which befalls us was, reg was regarded as a virtue by the Stoics, a virtue that we've lost a little bit of sight of. We forget that we're not in control of everything. But the ability to endure things that we're not in control of is a Stoic virtue. As opposed to, says Epictetus, what we do willingly endure. 
Epictetus guides us to a great example where he says, you know, you'll willingly endure a whole bunch of things if there's going to be financial reward at the end of it. But if there's only going to be virtuousness at the end of this, then you probably won't uh, tolerate it at all. If all I get out of this is I did the right thing, I might be less inclined to tolerate the situation than if there was a financial reward at the end. If I just zip my lip and they buy my product, then I'm going to tolerate their lifestyle. But if I can see no benefit to me, then I'm not. What Epictetus says is that that error is caused by our mistaken judgment concerning what actually has value and what does not. He says, if you're valuing, if, you, if you're tolerating because you get the money at the end, but you're not tolerating when all you get is being the good guy at the end, then your value system needs a little bit of reflection. Epictetus says, a good man does not himself quarrel with someone, and nor does he allow, as far as he is able, someone else to do so. Socrates said, you are not in control of another's ruling principle. You are not the master of what guides another person's thoughts, what guides their morals. Their, their moral center and their intellectual center is not up to you. So arguing with them or allowing them to argue is an effort to take control of their ruling principle. And he says, rather, don't will anything other than what is yours to will. Don't try and make someone else believe something because you're not the master of their guiding principles. Rather, convince yourself of something where you are the master. And that, of course, can lead to disciplined behaviors, to improving our behaviors, if we convince ourselves of something. But bottom line, says Epictetus, is that's the only person you can convince. And Epictetus, therefore, frames the inability to put up with others as a failure to make that critical judgment of what is ours and what isn't. So much of what I'm saying can just be boiled down to that. If you fail to judge correctly, what is up to you and what is not, you can get into an argument with someone because you don't realize that their thinking is not up to you. The core misunderstanding that we make, says Epictetus, is that judgment, that the opinions and beliefs of others matter in terms of whether I'm okay or not. It reflects the mistaken judgment that the beliefs and the opinions of others are up to us, that we can control the beliefs and opinions of others, and in so doing, find our own contentment. And it's a powerful point because why do we get so unhappy and freaked out when others are not in agreement with us? Why does someone else's belief or theory or idea set us off so much? Why do we get so upset that we can't sleep? when someone is saying something we disagree with on social media. We do because we fail to understand that we do not exercise decisive control over their beliefs and opinions, and that our own happiness does not depend on anything to do with their beliefs and opinions. And once we make that connection, we can stop getting so upset about what everyone else is saying on Facebook or anyone else. So, we give up our happiness to the wills of others when we allow it to depend on controlling or influencing what they think. And how do we come to be the kind of people who are tolerant? Epictetus says it himself. He says, in particular, we need to cultivate the ability to endure the criticisms of others. So it works two ways. On the one hand, I mustn't get all het up about what you think, because I have no control over what you think, and my happiness does not depend on that. And on the other hand, um, 
when I disagree or when you disagree with me, I must be okay with that and not have the need to rise up, respond or depend or defend myself. In the end, the Stoics have given us the most important lesson of all. Our happiness does not depend on someone else's thoughts and opinions, not about their own stuff and nor about ourselves. If we concentrate on being responsible for our own guiding principle and our own happiness, we will readily tolerate those of others without having to change them. Next week, it's time again for the month ahead, so be sure to join me at the same time.